So what we're going over today is um, cognition, cognition, intelligence, thinking. Um, and this is the, the end point of the trilogy of what we started with with conditioning. So we started with conditioning, which is relatively permanent change in behavior due to experience. Then we got into memory, with the, which is the persistence of conditioning over time. And now we're getting into cognition, which is the application of conditioning and memory. It's what makes us human. It's what makes us different than non-cognitive beings. Uh, and so when we talk about this, we're going to talk about how, what thinking really is, um, what intelligence is, and then we're going to talk about language just a little bit. And then finally, we'll kind of talk uh, about the notion of artificial intelligence and what it is and how it's vastly different than uh, human intelligence and what the limitations are today and what we consider the possible um, limitations to be in the future. So when we're talking about human intelligence, uh, we, <coughs> excuse me, we, we tend to think about things as humans in the, in the realm of concepts. And there are two basic concepts that we use in order to think about things. There are formal concepts and there are natural concepts. Formal concepts are defined by specific rules. It's the way that we categorize things. So if you go back and think from the very first lecture, there was that term that I kept saying over and over, gestalt, that meaning the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so when we look at this, when we look at um, the formal concept, we are saying that we are going to come up with a, a bunch of different uh, uh, individual components that must or must not be present for something to fit into this formal concept, this gestalt idea. Um, and so one of the easier ways to do this is just to use an example, such as uh, a sport. You know, what would we consider... A, it are the components of a sport. So you might say that it is a competition between two teams that are trying to, to trying to defeat the other and that it is a physical activity and it has a specific uniform and specific um, pieces of equipment. Okay, so if you think about basketball, baseball, football, those all fit the formal concept of a sport. But then if you watch ESPN or if you watch Fox Sports, you're going to see some things on there that maybe doesn't fit what we think about when it comes to sports. Things like um, poker. If you watch ESPN, and not so much now, but a couple years ago, they were showing poker quite a bit. And that really doesn't fit what we normally think of when it comes to sport. Um, a lot of people also look at things like uh, chess. Is that a sport? Well, it's a competition, but it's not really a physical activity. And so the formal concept is what we universally accept as this is what fits and this is what doesn't fit. So in biology, we try to use as much formal concepts as possible. You know, what determines whether you are a mammal or a reptile, um, those are formal concepts. Natural concepts on the other hand, is what really happens in the real world, okay? Natural concepts form as a result of the real world, okay? And so the best example I have of a natural concept is a platypus. A platypus doesn't fit formal concepts because if you look at it, it has characteristics of uh, a fish a little bit, it has a little bit of a marsupial, it has a, a, has a mammal, um, it kind of the duck-billed platypus kind of has a feature of a bird, you know, what the heck is it? It doesn't fit formal concepts, so we have to put it into a category in the formal concepts that has an asterisk next to it, but in the natural concept, it works because we look at it and we say, well, yeah, that's definitely a, a platypus, but past that, what the hell is it? And so there's this fuzziness that goes with natural concepts, but formal concepts are defined. So in culture today, um, in my human sexuality class, we, have, we had a, a, about a four-class section discussion about the current state of gender and the argument of, you know, what is gender, what are the different types of gender. And so the formal concept of gender, uh, of 
of gender is that it is binary. It is that's the formal scientific way of looking at it. There's maleness and femaleness, and you can skew that on a scale, but it's basically we're starting at maleness and femaleness, boy, girl. But the natural concept is if we look around the world, there's all different types of categories of gender. And so this is the disconnect when we're trying to think. Uh, if, if, if you consider the fact that you can sit next to somebody and talk about gender and we both might have different definitions of it, we have to, uh, the argument kind of stops if you say, well, there's a formal concept and a natural concept and neither one is more valid or less valid than the other. It's just how you want to talk about it and how you want to deal with it. Okay, so from the formal concept and the natural concept comes this notion, this term prototype. And a prototype is the example of a concept, either natural or formal, that closely matches the defining characteristic. Easier way of thinking about it is that the prototype is the thing you think of first. It's if I say, think about a car, most people think about, you know, something with four wheels, you know, for the most part, most of you probably think of either one of two things, either your car, the car that you own, or a car that you might want to own. So um, most people, when you think of the prototype of a car, don't think about a 1970s Ford Pinto, simply because most people don't own that, and that's usually not somebody's dream car. So the prototype is going to fit whatever it is you think of. And so going back to our discussion about gender, most people when you say boy or girl, you think about a, what is normally considered to be a boy or girl. You don't think about the things that are on the fringe unless that is something that you think about consistently. Like if you have, if you yourself are transgender and you think about, and I tell you to think about a boy and the prototype is someone who's biologically male but uh, more associates as a female gender, that might be your prototype. It's what you think of, but it, it wouldn't match the, what I would say, the generally uh, used prototype. So if I say think of a fruit, most people think apple, banana, uh, maybe an orange. Most people don't think tomato. Even though tomato is a fruit, it's not the prototype. It's not the first thing most people think of, unless for some reason you just learned recently that tomatoes are actually fruits. And then you would think, wow, well, you know, I say fruit, and that pulls to your mind. But still, the prototype you tend to think of is the thing that would come to your mind first. So what is the process of cognition? The process of cognition is essentially, for humans, problem solving. But we use thinking in order to solve problems. And how do we solve problems? We use things that we have done in the past, so conditioning, and we remember it. We think about it and we remember it. And so we're using sections five and six, conditioning and, and memory, in order to mold those into a new situation. So I have memories of when I've tried something before, and then I'm looking at something, and I, I, I think, okay, so this has very similar characteristics, but it also has a few different characteristics. So if I handed you, let's say you've always used a PC your entire life, and I hand you a MacBook, okay? Historically, you've used a laptop before, so you know what the buttons are. You know how to open the screen up. You know kind of where to look for the power buttons. Um, and so that's based on memory and conditioning. However, you're going to have some tricky things that might come up, such as if you're used to hitting control C to copy something, you're going to notice that you really can't do that on a, I, wait, I think it does have control, but there's some, there's some like, instead of the start button, there's an Apple button. Um, there's all different types of things that you're going to have to try to figure out. And that's what problem solving is all about. So when it comes to problem solving, there's three basic types of problem solving. Each of them have their benefits and each of them have their deficits. The first version of problem solving is trial and error. And so trial and error is you try one possible solution after another until you're successful. Okay? So if I open up my, a MacBook and I have no idea what to do and I want to turn it on, a trial and error system might be I'm going to hit every button in succession until I find one that turns the computer on. Okay? So I might start with the escape key, then F1, F2. And trial and error truly is trial and error. It's just basically you're just going to try one after the other until you find it. And with trial and error, there is no, uh, there's no um, pattern. So basically, I can just sit here and mash buttons. I can hit escape, H, Q, delete, enter, up space, down space, space bar, and then I hit the power button and it turns on. 
it's just trial and error, okay? If I were to hand you a huge wad of keys, like, uh, like a janitor would have on his belt, and I would say, I need you to go down to my office and pick something up for me, and I just throw you the keys and you walk out. Trial and error would literally be you just pick a random key and try to put it in the hole and see if it turns. And then you just pull it out and you take another one and randomly try it. That's trial and error. Will you eventually get the solution? Yes, you will eventually get it. Could you possibly get it on your very first try? Yeah, you could. Could it take hundreds of tries? It could. Trial and error is probably the least effective, but unfortunately, sometimes we get it on our first or second try, and so we believe trial and error works better than what it does. A, more, a better way of doing that exact same thing would be to use an algorithm. Okay? An algorithm would be, I hand you this big wad of keys, it's on a huge ring, and it has 30 keys. Instead of just using like key 1, then key 7, then key 2, then key 14, and then key 3, uh, because I might forget which ones I've tried, and I might use key 1, key 7, key 13, then hit key 1 again because I really didn't you know, keep track of what I was doing. An algorithm would be, I start at maybe the biggest key on the ring, and I go around in a perfect circle around the ring. Okay, And it's a specific step for solving your problem. So I know if that key is on there somewhere, I'm going to get the right answer. I'm going to find the right key. Now, with the algorithm, the beauty of it is you're going to eventually get there. Um, Try, with trial and error, you get, you get the feeling that you're somehow magical if you get it on the second try. With the algorithm, you know it's just a process of elimination. The third type is a heuristic. And a heuristic is actually what you would probably do if I handed you those big wad of keys. Okay? A heuristic is a guess based on experience, or what we like to call the rule of thumb. And, and what this is, is basically, if I throw you my wad of keys, and on there, there's a bunch of different types of keys, and a couple of them appear to be car keys, and a couple of them appear to be like keys to a, a padlock, and some of them appear to be house keys, and then some of them may look like they would belong at an office because they're bigger, and they may have do not duplicate on them. The heuristic would be that you would take a guess based upon things you've experienced before. And so the first experience would be, I don't need to try the, key, the, the ones that look like car keys because I've never in my life been able to open a door with a car key. And I walk down to the door and I see that the door is a relatively big uh, keyhole. And so these little ones that say master lock, they're probably not going to work. So I'm going to use the ones that look like they might work. And so of the 30 keys, maybe only four look like office keys. And so I use those four and lo and behold, the third one opens the door. It's basically using an algorithm with evidence. So you don't have to go through every single one. If you were using a true algorithm, you actually would ne necessarily need to put the car key in the door to see if it would turn because that's the only way to eliminate it. With a heuristic, you're going to use what you believe to be uh, best evidence. Okay. So when you lose your keys at home, let's say you, you didn't put them down where you normally do and um, you need to find them, most people start with a heuristic. They think, well, the first place you look is where you normally put them. They're not there. And so you think, okay, where, where did I have my keys last? And so you start to look through um, maybe your bag. You go to the pants that you took off yesterday and you look in the pockets. That's a heuristic. And you find that you know, they're not there. The next step would be uh, to use an algorithm. And the algorithm would basically be, you're going to start at one corner of the room and search everywhere, back and forth and back and forth, every crevice, every, every place you could possibly have put the keys until you find it. That's going to be a, a very taxing thing if you have a big house, but eventually you're going to find them unless you were completely wrong and you accidentally left them outside. And I'll tell you, you know, how this has happened to me before. Um, I've I couldn't find my keys, couldn't find my keys, couldn't find my keys, so I did the heuristics, checked where I normally would leave them, couldn't find them, did the algorithm, looked everywhere, couldn't find them, finally got you know, really frustrated, and uh, lo and behold, opened my front door, and they were hanging in the deadbolt. So it didn't fit my algorithm, because I expected that I had to get in the house, so the keys had to be in the house, but my information, my premise was wrong, and as soon as I opened the door, I realized that I'd left my keys in the deadbolt. So... Um, you're no, there's no 100% guaranteed problem-solving technique because sometimes things are outside of the scope of 
um, of how we're going to actually get through the, the problem that we're trying to figure out. I'm not sure why I'm not going forward there. So some barriers that we have to problem solving. Functional fixedness. Functional fixedness is thinking about only the most typical functions of an object. Okay, So functional fixedness essentially means that if I have a screw that I need to screw into something, I need a screwdriver to, to be able to do this. Okay, Now, most of us get over functional fixedness and we realize that in a, in a jam, anything can be anything. Okay, most of us have at one time or another used maybe a dime as a screwdriver or if you have something that needs to be nailed in somewhere and you don't have a hammer anything harder than a nail becomes a hammer I've known you know people use books people use the those the sole of their shoe anything to just be able to do that um, when you're cooking and you don't have the exact thing you need for your recipe all of a sudden people become chemists and chefs combined and they try to put things together um, that is getting over functional fixedness but if you believe you need some specific tool to complete the task that's functional fixedness um, mental set is another problem solving barrier and that is where we uh, we use our past problem solving patterns over and over and over even if they aren't working now. And this is where addictions kind of come in. This is where bad behaviors tend to come in. Um, you know, I, you, you do something and you do it over and over, and even though it's not working for you, you still continue to do it. So the problem gambler who doesn't have enough money to pay rent goes to the slot machine or goes to the scratch-off tickets and thinks, well, I'm going to win my rent, and lo and behold, at the end of the month, they've lost all their money and they have to start over again. So that's a mental set where they're using what may have worked one time. Maybe it worked once, but now it's, it's not something that, that logically is going to work over and over and over. One that we tend to hear in the social sciences quite a bit, another problem solving barrier, is something called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias, this, if you go on YouTube and you look at um, specifically uh, things that, uh, arguments that people make because they have a very strong political opinion, um, they're usually using confirmation bias, especially things like, um, you know, when, when it was Trump versus uh, Clinton, people would look for evidence that supported their own beliefs. So if you, if you were a Trump supporter, you would hear him saying things like, uh, like the uh, immigration issue, that he wanted to uh, secure uh, the borders so that illegal immigrants could not enter in as easily. And so if you were a Trump supporter, you would say, yeah, absolutely, that's a good idea because they're coming in illegally and we don't want illegal immigration, we want legal immigration. But if you were a Clinton supporter, you would hear him say that and you would probably look for evidence that Trump was being racist or was being, uh, you know, kind of a... Uh, 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 an individual who doesn't want people to immigrate and so you would say look you know he's saying again he doesn't want immigrants he doesn't want immigrants he doesn't want immigrants and so that's confirmation bias and the best place to see confirmation bias in action is if you ever just read through the comment section of um, YouTube or um, or Yahoo articles uh, or CNN um, the the if you look after a story and you look at the conversations that people are having and making comments about that's most of the time you're just seeing people in their own little echo chamber. They're experiencing confirmation bias and they will ignore evidence that doesn't fit their beliefs. Okay, So if, if one argument I've heard, I'm not going to say whether this is right or wrong, I just this is just an, an uh, example that, that has been prevalent, people who say that Trump has racist ideologies uh, and people will then come back and say, well, wait a second, he, he employs a good number of minorities, he married somebody who's not technically of his race, even though they're both uh, Caucasian. Um, uh, he, you know, he, he seems to have some friends that are across the spectrum. It doesn't really seem like he could be racist if all these things are true. And people who don't want to hear that will just kind of ignore it because it doesn't fit their confirmation bias. And it's not right or wrong. It's just the way humans are kind of wired. That's what we do. Um, okay, so those are the, the ways that we think. Now, l let's talk a little bit about intelligence, okay? When I say intelligence, most people think smart you know how smart are you what are your smarts what are what's the way you're thinking and intelligence is really a, a more untangible 
uh, and hard to describe thing. And it's not necessarily just how smart you are because some people are incredibly smart in different ways, and some people, uh, you know, may be intelligent with different aspects of their life. And so when we talk about intelligence, normally when people say intelligence, they think of crystallized intelligence, cognitive intelligence, but there are different types of intelligence. One person who came up with a theory to kind of explain this was Spearman. And Spearman came up with what we call Big G Theory, so capital G Theory. And G Theory is essentially the notion that intelligence can be broken down into three different types of intelligence. There's S1 intelligence, S2 intelligence, and S3 intelligence. And you put those together and you get capital G intelligence, which is your global intelligence. But S1 intelligence is academic intelligence. So, you know, book smart. How, how well you do on tests, how well you do in science and STEM. S2 intelligence is more um, kinesthetic. You know, how, how athletic are you? How well can you move your body? How can you control your body? Uh, and that's a form of intelligence. And then S3 intelligence is artistic intelligence. Um, you know, maybe you can create art, and maybe you can create poetry, or maybe you can interpret poetry incredibly well, or maybe you can create music that is beautiful. You don't necessarily have to have high S1 intelligence in order to have high S3 intelligence. And you may have high S1 and S3, but not S2. Okay, So the easiest way to think about this, and it's not the most politically correct way, but I think it helps people kind of understand, if you think about high school and you go back to the cafeteria, if you can break people out into three different groups, you have, and I'm going to use terms that probably aren't the kindest, but you have the, the nerds in one group, you have the jocks in one group, and you have the art artist type people, the drama, band, choir, art type people in another group. And those three groups, whatever one you would kind of fall into as your default would be your primary intelligence according to Spearman. Now, does that mean that there's not got people in the jock group that aren't smart? No, there, there probably are. But it's whatever one you default back to. Um, are there some artists who also are probably incredibly great athletes? Yes, but again, the, the person who identifies themselves and, and does best with artistic thinking would fall into the S3 category, uh, and they, would, they might have high S2 and S1. You can have high on all three, but it's still the one that you fall back into. Where does this actually come into play? Uh, well, knowing yourself is always important, but a lot of research has been done about teaching methods and learning methods. And what we have found is that if we can cater classes and teaching opportunities to your primary S, S1, S2, S3, people can learn better in that way. And what I mean by that is if I had a group of S2s, I wouldn't want to teach them the same way that I teach S1s. S1s, if I were going to teach um, Civil War history, S1s, I'd probably just lecture. I'd probably give the information, give them books, give them uh, you know, things to look at th and discussion, and that's the way that I would teach them. S2s, because they learn better and they're more apt to understand things that they're actually doing, activity, maybe I would have them recreate battles. You know, maybe I would have them go outside and you know, s separate them into the north and south and uh, you know, kind of lay of the land. Um, you know, theoretically, if I were teaching... If I got hired to teach the Notre Dame football team over the summer, Civil War, I might have the offense be north and the defense be south, and we go out on the football field and we kind of say, okay, so the end zone is Florida and the other end zone is Maine, and I'd have them move around and, and just try to learn the different parts of the Civil War. And then for the S3s, I might look at the art of the time and the music of the time and uh, have them uh, you know, really get a good visual of what was going on. So by maybe instead of writing an essay, maybe uh, you know, drawing or painting pictures or sculptures of what things may have looked like at that time. This is great if you could register for classes this way. Unfortunately, you can't. Uh, you know, I don't offer Psych 101 for S1s, Psych 101s for S2s, Psych 101 for S3s. Uh, and so what ideally we do 
is we try to teach a little bit from each. And so, uh, you know, I try to throw a lecture at you and then I try to th show a documentary so that you can kind of see how things are actually moving in space and time. Uh, and so that's kind of for the S2s, more, you know, more visual, more kind of getting, you know, your body into it. Um, and then for the artistic, it kind of showing how things look in reality instead of just trying to describe the brain uh, really uh, you know uh, giving visual examples and moving uh, documentaries where you can actually see MRIs and fMRIs um, and so to go back a couple of class lectures um, when I was teaching about conditioning when I shot people with n the nerf gun that was really an s2 type of thing that, y that your body was getting involved your you know people were you know seeing the darts coming at them feeling it having to move and think about what they were doing that's an s2 way of doing it the s1s uh, people who were s1 dominant were probably thinking you know why is he shooting us and s3s were thinking uh, again why was he shooting us but the s2s that probably helped them or hopefully helped them to get into to uh, a more fluid way of learning about, um, about conditioning. So there's another person who came up with uh, multiple intelligences outside of Spearman. Spearman was the three different types, S1, S2, S3. Gardner came up with eight, or I'm sorry, nine different types, and I'm not going to have you learn these, um, but they're basically just breakouts of S1, S2, and S3. So there are different types of multiple intelligence. Um, and then there's Sternberg's triarch theory again, basically the same thing as S1, S2, S3, so I'm not going to go over those in depth. Okay, so I'm going to skip over some of these. Okay. So now let's get into intelligence, the, the crystallized notion of intelligence that most people think of when we're thinking about uh, cognition and intelligence. Intelligence has a very long history, but it's actually kind of, it's, it's pretty much taken longer than psychology has been around, but there's a lot of misconceptions about what intelligence is. Um, the central topic of intelligence is figuring out what makes people cognitively different from each other. That some people can simply think about something in one way and other people think about it in another way and uh, there, there's, a, there's a difference in the way that we interpret it. And we know this to be just basically the difference between a subjective and objective experiences, but if you give somebody the same evidence as someone else, why do they come to different conclusions or why do they process it differently? Why is it that some people can sit in class and listen to a lecture and learn algebra and other people just never really get their head wrapped around it? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about intelligence. Okay, so when most people think about intelligence, they think about a term that is very misunderstood, and that term is IQ, or intelligence quotient. And I'm not going to bog down the process of what, how we get intelligence quotients. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history, uh, because um, uh, Kulit um, and Binet are two people that really came up with the notion of testing intelligence. Um, Culet, um is was a scientist for the Belgian army and his he was tasked with something that uh, Binet, which um, Alfred Binet was a French educator, they were basically tasked with the same thing. And it was, how do we categorize people? How do we, how can we quickly categorize people into functional categories? So um, while while Culé was uh, an e was was the first to do it, Binet's story is actually easier to understand. So, as an educator, Binet was tasked by the French government to basically figure out a way to test children so that you could figure out which ones needed special attention, either because they were exceptional or because they were they were falling behind. And then the rest of the people, the rest of the students, could then be put into normal classes. So, you know, in, in today's culture. It would be trying to categorize who would need uh, what used to be called special, ed special education. Now it's got a whole bunch of different names, but um, special education, mainstream, and advanced placement. Okay, and so what Binet came up with was this test that took your um, your actual age, your your year age, and then he gave a test based upon. Uh, that basically ask questions that people around your age should be able to know or complete. So mathematics, science, uh, vocabulary. And so what he would then do is take your chronological age, your actual age, and he would divide that by your mental age. 
so what what you got on hit what score you got on his test and then multiply that by a hundred okay so let's do an easy one let's say that I'm 10 years old chronological chronological age and I score a 10 on the test and that's my mental age so 10 over 10 is 1 times 100 that means that I have an IQ of 100 okay now it gets really you don't need to get into hard mathematics to see if your mental age is lower than your chronological age your IQ is going to go down if your mental age is greater than your chronological age then your IQ is going to go up using simple math if I am 10 years old and I take the test and I test that the mentality of a five-year-old without even doing math you should know that a ten-year-old with the mentality of a five-year-old is gonna have a low IQ and so if you actually do the math it's five over ten which is 0 0.5 times 100 the IQ would be 50 on the other end if I'm a ten-year-old but I test at the mental age of a 20 year old that's a pretty smart kid so 20 over 10 is 2 times 100 that's an IQ of 200 okay so that was the original way by which um, IQ was tested. Today it's a little bit different but basically the same thing and here I'm gonna get into some statistics and I'm not asking you to learn how to do statistics I'm just asking you to hear the terms and kinda of get a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about here okay so what we're seeing when it comes to IQ in testing today is that no matter what we're going to use what's called the standard distribution of intelligence or what's better known as the bell curve and what the bell curve tells us is that if we look at the average um, IQ for people we know that there's going to be an equal number of people with above average IQs and an, a, a, an equal number of people so 49.999% of people will have below average IQs, 49.99999% of people will have above average IQs, and then 0.0001% will have an IQ of exactly 100, okay? And the way that this works out is 34% of people have an IQ that we call one standard deviation above the average, and 34% of people have a, uh, an IQ 34% below the average. So what that means is 68% of the population have an IQ within one standard deviation of the average. So the average IQ is 100 and one standard deviation in IQ is 15. Okay? So 68% of people have an IQ between six or 85 and 115. And so in this bell curve, we consider 85 to 115 to be average. 100 is the average. 85 to 115 means you have an average IQ. Okay? Then we go one more standard deviation. Okay? And one more standard deviation is going to be plus 15 and minus 15 again. So we are at 100 is the average. Plus 15 plus 15 would be 130. Minus 15 minus 15 would be 70 okay so a range of 70 to 130 is considered normal okay so 100 is the average 85 to 115 is an average IQ 70 to 130 is a normal IQ which means and, and in that we have an extra 27 percent so we've gotten up to 96 percent of the population have normal IQs between 70 and 130 which means that we have four more percent and two percent of the population have an exceptional IQ and two percent of the population have a below normal IQ this is what we call people above 130 are called above average or we call that normally genius so the genius mark is 130 and on on the other end we have intellectual uh, disabilities what we used to call mental retardation and that's what I was trained in and that's the the people I work with um, used to have the diagnosis of mental retardation and so I still use that term um, quite a bit so I do apologize that sometimes I use that older term but people with an IQ under 70 would be considered uh, to have mental retardation or intellectual disabilities and even inside of that that 70 points of 0 to 70 there's subcategories there's mild intellectual disability moderate severe profound on the other end 
130 to 145 is you know your normal run-of-the-mill genius which is still amazing but then above 145 you get less and less people for every point there's less people in the world that have that so if you get up to an IQ of like 200 there's like a handful of people with that the same thing as somebody with an IQ of under 20 there's only a handful of people like that so when somebody asks you what is an average IQ it's very simple it's a hundred no matter what however we have gotten into a new form of test which is called the um, which is called the Weschler intelligence test that's the most commonly used intelligence test that we have it's called the WACE W-A-I-S or the WISC W-I-S-C the WACE is the adult scale the WISC is the children scale. So it's really easy if you were to be asked this question, which one's for adults, which one's for children? You can basically just look for which one has a C, children, or A, adult. And what we do to make sure that this is a valid test is every 10 or so years, they re-standardize the test. Okay? So what that means is that we look at Every 10 years or so, we test thousands of people, and the average IQ of 100 may change a little bit, but it's still 100. Okay, so this gets a little tricky. So if you, you can't compare, if I have an IQ of 100 today, it's not necessarily the same thing as an IQ of 100 50 years ago. It's still average. I'm still, comparatively, it still works, but absolutely, it's, it's not a good comparison. Because the intelligence, the average intelligence of somebody today is different than somebody 50 years ago. So every time they re-standardize it, it changes what the average is, but it doesn't change the fact that an average intelligence of 100 today is still, it, it was, it's the same as the average 50 years ago, but you, if you were to have those two people compete against each other in some kind of intellectual um, capacity, there's going to be a difference. And so if you were to give somebody the, um, the, the scoring standard from, 19, from the 1950s, they're going to get a different IQ simply because it's standardized against people in the 1950s. Again, this is a really complex statistical thing that they do. Um, but just know that an IQ today, you can't compare your IQ to what Einstein's IQ was uh, because it's differently standardized. My assumption is no matter what, Einstein's IQ is going to be higher than everybody that I'm talking to right now. But um, it's not going to, you can't compare apples and apples because it's, it's apples and oranges, but it's still, his high IQ still indicates that he would have an high IQ. It just wouldn't be the exact same number, okay? Um, and again, we've talked about correlation coefficient before, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, one thing we have to differentiate here, though, is achievement versus aptitude, okay? Intelligence tests are achievement test. What is your intelligence today? Aptitude test is what is your ability given unlimited resources or, or given how high can you go, okay? So if I look at, um, it, it's, it's the difference between if I wanted to do some kind of assessment on eighth graders who were running track, okay? If I had a, like a group of kids who were running the 100 meter dash and the fastest one could run it in 12 seconds, okay? So his achievement is he can run the 100 in 12 seconds, but he's also only 13 years old. And so his aptitude, if he can run a, a 13 second or a 12 second 100 at the age of 12 or 13, his aptitude is that maybe he can run a 10 second 100 when he turns 20. So the achievement is not the same as the aptitude. This is the same thing as um, a lot of people look at things like the SAT and the ACT and say it's unfair it's an unfair test when you are comparing kids who come out of better schools versus kids who are coming out of worse schools. In theory, the, it's, the SAT is actually the Scholastic Aptitude Test. It's supposed to be testing your aptitude. A lot of people would argue that it's not, that it's actually testing achievement, but theoretically the SAT is supposed to test all things being equal, how well could you do in college if you get all the same resources. It's, that's not technically what it does, but that's the goal. It's to say, what could you do if you were given great resources? Um, and we still don't ag exactly agree on which one intelligence is, whether it's aptitude or achievement. I would say it's more achievement than anything, but there are some sub subtests in the intelligence, uh, the waste and the whist, that actually do try to look towards aptitude. 
Um, so we've already talked about Binet. I'm not going to go over that again because that would be um, just repetitive. Here, um, WAIS, the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale. Um, this is a little bit dated because they've actually changed uh, the verbal and performance subscales. So just disregard that. Uh, in the newest version of the waste, they took away the verbal and performance subscales and they, they, they made it different. Um, and then we've already talked about Spearman a little bit, so we don't have to go over that.